Welcome to Gent Bible Student Ministries. I'm so glad you're with us this morning. And yes, what it is December the 1st. And what an amazing, yeah, what an amazing time to be here together. We got to worship together and sing and worship our Lord and Savior. So it's always fun this time of season. And we're celebrating. Actually, today we are starting a series called Advent, but it's because um, Advent itself begins today on this day, which is really uh, fitting. It's really cool. Just around four Sundays before Christmas, uh, a lot of people around the world uh, begin Advent today, and we're going to get into that. Just is really this idea of waiting for the arrival of Christ on earth. So we're waiting for him to come. And even the whole world, regardless of what they think about Jesus, kind of participates in Advent, even if they don't realize it. Even just by this Christmas cheer that everyone talks about. And so it's all geared towards we're waiting for Christ to be born and to celebrate that birth. And that's Advent. We're waiting. So I got to thinking, because of also the, uh, this is a crazy time where we just had Thanksgiving, but now we're quickly uh, kind of shifting into uh, Christmas mode, and it's, it's great. Uh, is this any of y'all's, uh, how many of y'all have a birthday in December? So this is a good month for you, really special. How many of you just in general is Christmas, or is December like one of your favorite months? Maybe also because you got at least maybe a week out of school there. Okay, sweet, we can just agree collectively. It's a lot of ours. I understand. So I just found, I did some research because on Friday, what a lot of Americans did, even though it was kind of raining, it was they wanted to go out and get a great deal on something or deals on something. And some of you, maybe in this room, you don't have to, remember, you can raise your hand uh, in your heart if you want. You don't have to raise your actual hand. But uh, some of you went and maybe waited in line just to be a part of it. You didn't even maybe want to buy anything. You just kind of like the busyness of it. And you just want to get out there. Maybe, I don't know. That's just maybe your personality. Um, you're just maybe you want to break up fights. I don't know. Um, you're just being the peace uh, person. Or maybe you're there for the free donuts and coffee. I don't know what your life is. But uh, maybe some of you did go out Friday and you shopped around. Even though it's kind of a, a grisly, kind of a, oh, kind of a weird day where you just want to sit inside and not do much. And maybe it's drink a uh, hot beverage, hot, hot chocolate, and not do anything. And so, but some of you may have gone out and looking for these deals as a lot of Americans did. And it's a day where you can maybe, you know, um, tomorrow is a great day for that um, on Cyber Monday where a lot of uh, maybe you'll do your shopping. But it got, to me, it got me thinking, what is maybe sort of the history of how long people have chosen to wait in line for things, right? They have this, they have something they want and they want to wait for it. And there's this longing there. There's, there's this anticipation there. And so there's a few, there's a short list here of just a few things that people have generally waited for, and they've, they've been a long time uh, coming kind of thing. Back in 2006, when the PlayStation 3 was released, uh, that was just crazy, because apparently uh, they made it clear they did not have enough consoles for everyone. As a result, the lines uh, were just crazy, and it got a little out of hand. And across America, they waited days and days and days just for a chance to purchase this expensive thing. And so, you know, you kind of put your, your life on hold and you just say, I'm camping out here. And a lot, you know, I, can't, I think a minor way we do this is maybe uh, to start, maybe some of you have done the Chick-fil-A thing where you, as a grand opening, you've done that. And you get, what, 52 free uh, sandwiches or, or meals. Has anyone done that? That's incredible. No one here has done that. So I'll just move on. Uh, the iPhone. You know, so when the iPhone, uh, in 2013, when the 5S came out, uh, that really drove in the crowds, and it's just building every year. And in New York, they had at least 1,500 people um, that were there early and waited weeks just to get their iPhone. And so when you hear about, like, an iPhone release, all you think about is long lines, long lines, early mornings, people waiting to give them their money and to get something. More local, well, in Texas, uh, Franklin Barbecue down um, in Austin. They have so many, uh, they open at 7 a.m., and you need to get there by 7 a.m. if you want to have lunch, because they'll sell out every day. And they're known for um, banning kind of line sitters, and also, regardless of your celebrity status, you have to wait in line. No cuts at Franklin Barbecue. So if you've stood in line for barbecue that long, good job. And uh, the only exception they've ever made was for Barack Obama when he was visiting. So the only person that's ever cut lines for Franklin's Barbecue is the president. So there you go. Um, there's big things in California when they celebrate um, big events like Comic-Con. Uh, they've had thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people sleep weeks in sleeping bags for certain uh, close, closerness. I don't know. Better seats. Sure. Um, 
thousands of people uproot themselves, change their whole life, and chose to camp out there, um, this anticipation, this longing, just to go to an event. Maybe you've done that in a little way for a concert. You're like, oh, yeah, four hours, that's nothing. How about eight hours? Yes, we're going we're gonna to get there early. Or for the new Star Wars movie, maybe you've already, like, you have that ready. You know what you're going to do. Uh, it's not only that you got your ticket, but you want to be there really early just because. And there's this anticipation building for something like a movie. And it's driving you crazy and you're excited. That's actually the fifth one, um, Star Wars. It's had some of the longest lines in the history of uh, movies dropping. And so it started way back when. And now um, when The Force Awakens happened, there was 150 fans that braved very poor weather in Los Angeles. And they waited 12 days for tickets um, near in Hollywood. And so that doesn't sound great. Now it's, you know, you can stream it on many different platforms. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to wait at all. Um, but that's crazy. And maybe some of you are like that. But Christmas is sort of similar. We're acting, we're talking about, you know, waiting and, and anticipation. And you wait and anticipate a lot of things. You may not realize it. Uh, time off from school is at the top of your list always. And so when this, um, when this kind of shorter break ended, uh, ends, you're already, I mean, there's countdowns already for the next break. And then when you get back from that Christmas break, I'm sorry, I already talked about it. You're going to wait for the next break, spring break. And so you kind of, your life is kind of in, in chunks of when's my next break from school. And that's, a, I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's, it is what it is. Driving, I mean, that's a huge one. You're waiting the time you can drive and you have this uh, freedom, right? If you want to uh, go to the gas station and get a candy bar, you can. Uh, if you want to, I don't know why I said that, but uh, you can do, you have this freedom. You can go to the mall. If people still go to our Golden Triangle Mall, you can do whatever you want. You can go get the Chick-fil-A you want. You driving. You can drive yourself to the movies and then wait in line. A lot of you are waiting. Uh, the movie's release, and you love that, the line, um, and just waiting and talking to people. Maybe it's a video game that's being released, and you're going to get your friends, and you're going to wait however long it takes. And maybe it's a couple of months away, and you're already talking about it now, and you're anticipating what's it going to be like. Oh, man, I hope, it's, I hope it's good. Maybe it's a CD, like they're dropping an album in that way, and you're waiting for your favorite artist. They put the, uh, I think Justin Bieber is about to come out with the thing, and everyone's uh, going crazy about it. And all he has to do is, like, tweet out a couple of words, and the whole world turns to pandemonium. And there's this waiting and longing, like, no, now, I want it now. We don't like to wait. You know, you walk in the bank and you see those little lines there. You're like, oh, I'm not going to go through the, the lines, you know. We wait for a lot of things. Maybe it's a certain trip you're going to take this holiday break or next spring break or next summer, a road trip, and you're excited about it. But one of the main things you're going to, a lot of people in here wait for, and let's talk about it, the elephant in the room. Some of y'all have been waiting for this Sunday all year. You start listening to Christmas music, music in July, movies, Christmas movies in August. You have the presents wrapped in September, the tree up in October, lights in November, and then finally in December you just relax and drink eggnog and you're finally like at peace. And you're almost even over it because you started in July and that's great. And let me tell you this, hear me this Sunday morning. I am not here to make fun of you. I would never, but I am not here to make fun of those people that wanted to start celebrating Christmas in July or June. That's not why I'm here. I want to make an argument, actually, for that group, for you in here, that I don't want to have you, like, make, make yourself known. But if that's you, I, I'm related to some of these people that do that, so I, I got you. But here's my argument. What if they are right and the rest of us are wrong? What if they actually have it figured out? What if we should celebrate Christmas year-round? I don't know they just begin in July, but what if we should? Maybe what they're doing is simply anticipating the arrival of Jesus coming to earth. Maybe that's what they're doing. And, hear me out, and through this anticipation, their love and joy for Jesus only increases. So look at that. Their love and joy for Jesus only increases because they choose to celebrate it year-round. What if they're all right and we're wrong? Maybe, uh, can one of you that's, that does that, can, do we have any amends out there? Anyone that... Anything at all? All right, yeah. Anyone that wants to, that does that, you, you start listening to Christmas in July? Anyone? 
Any brave souls out there? Thank you for being brave. You know, it's kind of like the per- when you get the perfect gift for someone, maybe you're someone that spills the beans a lot. You have to literally take your mouth shut or you're going to give away your present. You're like, oh, they're going to love it. They're going to love it. And you just give it away months early. I don't know. Maybe that's not you. But when you buy the perfect gift for someone, it's really hard not to tell them about it because you're so excited. And you can't wait to see what they think of it. There's this anticipation. And there's this huge waiting and longing and anticipation that comes with Christmas, this season. And everyone feels it in the world. Non-Christians, Christians alike. Everyone knows that there's something different about December. And y'all, it begins today. It literally, it starts today, Advent, December 1st. Crazy. It was just November. We start anticipating now, kind of collectively, the Savior to be born. We anticipate the arrival or advent of Christ coming down to earth. That's why we're starting a new series called Advent. It's a season celebrated by Christians uh, as a time of waiting and anticipating uh, this, and celebrating Christ's birth. That's all it is. We get it from this Latin word that sounds like Advent, and that's even taken from a Greek word that just means Christ is coming down to us. So it really, Advent just means, yeah, he's coming. He's going to be born again. We're celebrating it. We're so glad he did. If you've ever wondered what that means, and they get the little chocolate calendars and stuff, I don't know, they put all the themes on them. If you go to Barnes & Noble, you'll see the 20,000 themes. You could buy your little Advent thing. But the idea, no matter what it looks like, no matter if it's like a TV show that releases like an Advent box, it's all, they don't even know it, but it's all rooted to celebrating Christ, our King, coming down to earth. Isn't that amazing? I think it's incredible. And so I'm really excited about this series. It's a four-week series. Today, and I have this kind of written for you on there. Today, we're going to look at the actual anticipation of Christ coming. And you guys are going to help me in a little bit. Some, I've already kind of predestined some things. This is week one, the anticipation of Christ's arrival on earth. Next week, we're going to look at the announcement of Christ coming. And there's a slide that shows all this. The announcement of Christ coming to Mary through the eyes of Mary. Then we're going to look at the actual arrival of Jesus through the eyes of the shepherds. And we're going to see why God chose to use a bunch of outcasts in this society, what shepherds were, but first to visit Jesus and to see the star. And we're going to look at his arrival in two weeks. And then the final week, we're going to meet right back here, and we're going to look at atonement. And we're going to look at Simeon the Jew, and he knew something. He knew what Jesus was going to have to do. And it's a really um, amazing story. And we're going to look at how he's the atonement for our sins. But this morning, we're going to look at Jesus coming to earth through the eyes of God. Because it's God's story. The Christmas story in itself is so much bigger than one month. It's so much bigger than the next 25 days leading up to Christmas and the big Christmas Eve service we have here. It's so much bigger than that. Because the Bible... Three chapters in, begins to anticipate Christmas coming. And we first celebrate Christmas in the garden, the Garden of Eden. Today, we're going to look at, like I said, you're going to help me in a little bit. But the next slide, I'm going to show you what the goal is for the day. I don't want you to get lost in some of the verses we're going to talk about. We're going to be looking at something called prophecy and how the Christmas story actually is true. And then you're going to see that the Christmas story is really just should be everyone's story of salvation. But I don't don't want you to forget this, the end goal. That we're going to have all this knowledge, we're going to see these verses, you guys are going to bring them to me. We're going to look at those, but I want that to enter your heart and impact it. And then exit through your hands and feet, and so you go impact the world. Because the anticipation of Christ arriving, so what we celebrate you know, silent night, holy night, Jesus born in Bethlehem. That idea, the anticipation of Christ's coming, should produce hope in you. This is your hope. And Christmas cheer through you. Because of the hope you have in, in Christmas and Christ, there is something called Christmas cheer we're going to talk about. And it should be impacting your friends and family and strangers. It should be moving you to tell others about Jesus and to extend the same hope you have to Jesus. And that's the goal today. So just hang with me. In a little bit, you're going to see something fun. We've never really tried this before. We're going to try it. Because Christmas 
We don't, we, you know the story, you know the story, you know the story. If you've been to church even just last year, you've heard it before. And so I want to challenge you to think about this series as something new, in a fresh way. And so when you hear scripture spoken, when you hear the story, pray that God would use it in your heart and soul like he's never has before. Like it's almost like the first time you've heard it, that he would move in you and change you in a way that maybe you haven't changed before. And we begin like this. Did you know that the actual birth we celebrate is the culmination of thousands of years of waiting and longing? That the actual story is in the Gospels. It's like right here. But the Christmas story is waiting. Look, all of this is waiting and pointing to the moment in Bethlehem where Christ Christ, he's a baby, and he's finally here. And then we have this little bit, New Testament. Little bit. All this gets lost. But this is the, really the Christmas story. But how often do we see that? Because Christmas didn't start at the North Pole, uh, certainly not at the North Pole, and it didn't even really start in Bethlehem. It started in a garden really far, far away, where God made man and woman in his perfect image. You know the story. In two chapters. We only got two chapters before we kind of blew it and we sinned. God made man and woman in his perfect image. Then they messed up the relationship. They disobeyed. And then it caused this split, this divide between God and between man and woman, between humans. Now there's hostility between them because they sinned against God. Sin just means missing the mark. If I were to tell all of you, the mark is this. Here's perfection. Here's the mark. Jump and touch the ceiling. How many of you could jump and touch the ceiling? No one. I love that answer. You missed the mark. We're all sinners. You could stand here a million years, and you couldn't hit that ceiling. You could jump and jump and jump and jump. You'll never hit the ceiling. And you can't use ladders and stuff like that. No, no. You're too smart for your own good. I love it. You're missing the mark, and Adam and Eve missed the mark, and now you inherit that. You being born human, you just inherit that sin, and you're sinners. You don't have to be taught to say no. You just do it. You're like, that's mine. <laughs> you're selfish. If you're around, a lot of you for the holidays were around little ones, and you maybe some, maybe even some little infants and toddlers, and you know, you're like, oh, geez, I just need a break. Yeah, they're, they're troublemakers. <laughs> you didn't have to teach them that. We all do that. But y'all hang with me here. I'm just setting up Christmas. God did something magical. I'm going to talk about the, he did something crazy awesome. Only verses after we messed up and we missed the mark, God chose to fix it. He chose to put a solution to our sin problem in place. In Genesis 3.15, this is Christmas in the garden. Watch this. I will put hostility between you and the woman. He's talking to, to the enemy here who caused the, the, the man and woman to sin, Adam and Eve to sin. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he, we take this at the Bible to believe that this is speaking of a future Christ, Christ Jesus coming down. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first, we would take this to be the first talk that Christmas, something like Christmas has to happen. This is hope to Adam and Eve there. That, hey, Adam and Eve, you messed up. Our relationship isn't perfect anymore. Uh-uh. There's distance now between us. But I'm going to fix it. Long, a long time in the future, I'm going to send someone to take care of sin. To be the uppercase lamb. And all throughout scripture, we see people realizing the need for a savior more and more. We're going to start Genesis in January, and you're going to see, oh man, um, God's people need a savior. That they're, they're rotten to the core. And they need something more. They need God to fulfill his promise. And they're going to look to this promise over and over and over again. And the Old Tis Testament simply anticipates the promise of this. Genesis 3.15. It all points back to that and the future saying, where are you, King Jesus? Where are you, Savior? God, you promised. Where is this God man? Where is this person that's going to save us from our sin? And if you read the Old Testament, all you can say is, the questions roll out. It's, will God fulfill his promise to Adam and Eve? Will he take care of sin? Is that king coming? Where is he? Is it this baby? Is it David? Is it this person? 
And with every new infant's cry throughout the Old Testament, Israel and everyone looked upon it and said, could this be the child? Could this be the one we celebrate to end it, to kill sin? And they looked with hopeful eyes, just dreaming of a Savior to be born. Something we celebrate now because it actually happened. And then here it is. Genesis 4, we know, this is, here's the Christmas story. The good news is, I got to give away the ending. Genesis, or Galatians 4, 4, look at this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. Do you see that, people? This is Christmas. This is what we celebrate. It actually happened. That finally, when God said it's time, after thousands of years, God said, you know what? I had a plan all along. And when the fullness of time happened, when it said, when it's on his watch, basically on God's timetable, on God's watch, beep, 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 beep. And Jesus steps down into humanity when God says so. God sent. Galatians 4.4. 4. We know this. We celebrate Christmas. We can actually just go ahead and close the service now. Uh, we, who needs four, four weeks, right? I mean, you know this, right? I hope you know this. The Galatians 4.4 4, that he sent his son when it was the fullness of time. And now we celebrate that at Christmas. It's Advent. So what's new? Well, this morning, I want to show you time before it was full. You see, time became full, fullness of time. I want to show you before that, before God sent Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, I want to show you that God didn't throw this plan together all of a sudden. That the Christmas story, yes, it's God's story, but it was perfectly planned out. There's details. We use that expression a lot. Uh, I just threw this together or something. Maybe it's for like a, a quick food dish or maybe it's uh, maybe an outfit or maybe it's, I don't know, an art, art project um, or maybe a paper. <laughs> yeah, I just threw it together. <laughs> um, there's really no thread at all. Um, we, we use that expression a lot, but that is not the expression you should use for God sending his son Jesus. He did not throw it together. It was perfectly executed and planned out. And when he said so, on his timetable, he's outside of time. But when the fullness of time had come, he said, it's happening. It's his sovereign will. And today, I want to show you this. I want, to be able, I want you to be able to answer this question. When someone were to walk up to you, this is the reason why we need to continue having this four-week amazing series. If someone were to come up to you and say, hey, tell me why the Christmas story is true, what would you be able to tell them? What would you be able to say, honestly? I mean, you know all the facts. You, 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 could, you could teach it better than I can a couple weeks about the whole, and, and the shepherds and, and how they were told. I mean, you, could, you know that story, but like in the back of your hand. I'm serious. Y'all could tell it better than I could. You're so smart. But what if someone asks you that? Hey, why is this story true? Like, why do we do this? What would you be able to say? Today, I want to, I want to show you that it was God's perfect plan. And there is details to it. And you can answer in hope and with boldness that it was 100% true. It wasn't thrown together. And so I thought you guys could help me do that. There's something called, of course, you know the, the term prophecy. Well, there's prophetic verses speaking about this Christmas story and Jesus as he even grows up that all actually happen. And I want to show you kind of turn this into a courtroom for the last few minutes. How about that? Instead of opening up this long passage, I want to show you pieces throughout the Old Testament that are like bright stars that you can hold on to and show people that, no, no, Jesus, was. this is all true. Look, over thousands of years, someone way back then said something, even this minor, that actually happened to Jesus. So we're going to be in a little courtroom today. And you know who's on trial? Little baby Jesus, <laughs> right here. Jesus is on trial, and I want you to see that everything that's said in the Bible about him is, is true. And I want you to be able to tell people that and hold your own, not just say, oh, because Keith says so. That's why the, the Christmas story is true, or my parents say so. No, I want you to know your scripture. Because one day soon, not so soon, don't, don't leave us yet, you're going to graduate and head off and 
Y'all make us proud in, in, in college or your, your, the workforce or wherever you do, the gap year. But we're not going to be, be around when you get asked those, those questions. And I desperately want you to be walking with Christ and to know him. And to know what you believe. To put it on the table. And so, watch this. We're going to have a couple witnesses. I have ten witnesses out and about. Out in a booth. <laughs> we have ten witnesses out there. And we're going to see. We're going to put it on the board. This is a trial, like I said. So, do we have our first witness out there? Do you have anything to say about Jesus? And if you, Oh, Tanner. Yeah, come forward. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you come forward? Thank you, Tanner. Tanner, very good. This is a good one. He says, Jesus is a descendant of David. Number one, Jesus is a descendant of David. That's really good. Good job, Tanner. Okay. This is in 2 Samuel 7, 13 through 16. I'm not going to, if you have a Bible, you, need, you can turn to these or write them down. And please look them up later for time. Watch what David said in the Old Testament long before. And look how Jesus said it. He shall build a house for not my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from you. And your house and your kingdom, here's the underline, your kingdom and your house shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. He is a descendant of David. And then in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to give you another verse to these that shows you how it was fulfilled. In Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the very first line of the book of Matthew, this is why it was written this way. This is why it says this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Did anyone else wonder why the first line is that? Why do they link them to David and Abraham? It does not make sense maybe to you. I don't know. Well, it did to me, and I said, why? Well, it's because of this. It was prophesied that he would come from the line of David. And the first chapter looks really boring, but you should, it's not. It's actually the most important thing ever. The first chapter of Matthew 1, you can read all the names. It's 14 generations. It shows how Jesus was straight up from the line of David, as prophesied. We are one for one. Actually, yeah, Jesus is one for one. And we're grateful for that, too. We can be grateful, too. Do we have our second witness as I tape this? Do we have our second witness? It may not work. Hello. Thank you. Speaking of David. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Hey, David. Uh, okay, number two. Prophesied the virgin birth. Isaiah 7, 14, the prophet Isaiah is in a lot of these. God used the prophet Isaiah to speak truth that would happen about Christ. We call it the messianic prophecy, the virgin birth. Rock it down, Isaiah 7, 14. You know the verse well, I think you do. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and, he shall, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Are you kidding me? I can't even predict, our weathermen can't even predict the weather. And this is saying, not only, you're going to have a son to a virgin, and you're going to call him Emmanuel, and it actually happened. This is a great witness. Thank you, David, for bringing this up. This is a great thing to remember. And next week, we're going to see how Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary. We're going to see Christmas through Mary's eyes. This week is Christmas through God's eyes. We're going to see Mary's perspective, Mary and Joseph's perspective next week. It's going to be incredible. And this was, of course, fulfilled in Matthew 1. Um, Isaiah 7 is fulfilled in Matthew 1, verses 20 through 22. As the, the angel appeared uh, to Joseph and said, This is just as, as was prophesied. You shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. What did it say? All this in verse 22 of Matthew 1 said, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. 
if you're sitting there, if you want to go ahead and open to the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, I'll, I'm going to show you all the scripture that fills it just in Matthew. You can flip and highlight if you want to be somewhere in your Bible. Do we have a third witness anywhere? Could we have a third witness? We've had great. Hello. Thank you. All right. We have a third witness. Okay. Oh, got it. This is huge. Yeah, born in Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Do you know that wasn't just by accident? God has a plan, by the way. Very accurate plan. And Micah. Anyone in here named Micah? Well, you got a little shout out there. <laughs> Micah 5, 2. But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from the old, from ancient of days. Even a little, what we might think, oh, what's the big, you know, Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the house of bread. Jesus will be born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, to feed the nations. Later in John to say, I am the bread of life. To be given out to the world. He was born in Bethlehem. To be a light to the world and to feed the nations. This is fulfilled in Matthew 2, verses 3 through 6. You want to write that down? When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all, this is so funny, y'all. All of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, well, duh, in Bethlehem of Judea. For it is also written by the prophet. King Herod wanted to hurt him, wanted to kill baby Jesus, and he said, where do we look? And everyone's like, do you not know your Bible? He's going to be born in Bethlehem. That's funny. All right, I'm laughing alone. All right, so um, I got my tape here. Do we have a fourth witness? Come forward. That's great. That sounded like, come forward. Oh, yours right there. Hello. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, witness number four to the stand. Remember, we have baby Jesus on trial. Um, is this story accurate? Can we, does it hold truth? Are we just, uh, why is this baby different? Star coming out of Jacob. Hmm, the star coming out of Jacob. This is in Numbers 24, 17. We're all over the board here. Look, we're back to Numbers. I see him, but here it is in Numbers 24, 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but do not, um, but not near. A star, listen to this. A star shall come out of Jacob. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down the sons of Sheth. Look at that. Numbers 24, 17. And it is fulfilled, y'all, in Matthew 2, 2. And it says, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. I think those shepherds knew their Bible as well. They said, I'm not sleeping on numbers. Nope, that's in my quiet time. I'm reading numbers. Awesome. The star is coming out of Jacob, and we're going to look at that in two weeks. Jesus is also called the morning star. He's the light of the world. I'm liking this. We're almost halfway done. Do we have a fifth witness anywhere? Hello. All right, fifth witness, come, come forward. <laughs> All right. They did move to, All right, they moved to Egypt. Thank you, good sir. All right. It's like a Christmas play. We should throw a Christmas play. Anyway, um, the move to Egypt, Hosea 11.1. 1. Hang with me here. We're almost done. This is fun, right? Ha, <laughs> you can laugh. When Israel was a child, listen to this. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. You may read the Bible and the Gospels and say, ah, eh, that's, that's cool. They moved to Egypt. But it's all for a reason. It's in God's perfect plan. This was not thrown together. Christmas wasn't thrown together. It was planned by a loving father. This is fulfilled in Matthew 2, verses 14 through 15. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. So they remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. If you read the gospel of Matthew, the one word I would say to highlight, to actually label the entire gospel of Matthew is the word fulfill. Fulfill. Because Christ fulfilled every prophecy that was spoken of him. Even something like they're going to go to Egypt to get rid of, to get away from Herod. He's trying to hurt him. We're going to go to Egypt. Everything, everything. The details matter. 
Do we have a sixth um, witness? Number six, witness number six. We do. Praise God. This is great. Thank you, Reagan. Thank you. Okay. This is a sort of like that one as well. This is um, the slaughter of the male children. Okay. Um, in Jeremiah 31, 15. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah. By the way, that's why we, we named our disc golf group Ramah, I think. Uh, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. In Matthew 2, 13, this is why they were going, escaping the slaughtering of the male children so Jesus would survive, just like the prophet said. Everything was done for a reason. Don't you see? King baby Jesus is looking true, accurate, it was planned for the world. And as we finish up here, just a few more. Do we have a, do we have a witness number seven out there? Do we have a, a seventh? Hey, look at you. Hey, thanks, Brooke. Awesome. Number seven, ministry in Galilee. Jesus would grow up. It continues on. This isn't just about the nativity scene. This is about his whole life. And Isaiah, the prophet, in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, said, you know what? This Savior of the world, he's going to do ministry in Galilee. Yep, he is. And that's exactly what happened. Hang with me here. We're almost done. But there will be no gloom for her who will be in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea and land beyond the Jordan. Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. And this is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. As he made residence and did ministry in Galilee. Even his ministry in Galilee is prophesied by Isaiah and it became true. Do we have a witness number 8 out there? All right. Servant ministry, that Jesus' ministry in Galilee, he's not going to be like this ruler that come and just like a dictator. He's going to have a humble heart, a servant, meek. And Isaiah 42, 1 through 4 says all of that. He says, he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street or bruised reed. He will not break and a, family bur and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Amen. And this is fulfilled in Matthew 12, verses 15 through 17. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him. And he healed them and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fill what was spoken um, by the prophet Isaiah. Jesus was bringing this servant-minded attitude and obedience to the world. He was going to have a ministry in Galilee, but he was a servant, a humble servant. We only have two more. Do we have a witness number nine? This is important. All right. Witness nine right here. Thank you so much. This one's uh, one of my favorites because it seems so minor. His triumphal entry. We have number nine here. Found in Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. Watch this. Humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. Seems kind of odd. But in Matthew 21, 2 through 4, Jesus said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. This took, all this took place because Jesus was fulfilling all prophecy. If he's going to ride in on a donkey, then he's going to ride in on a donkey. And the last one, witness number 10. Do we have a witness number 10 in the room? Can we give it up for witness number 10? Jojo, you out there? Look at that. Thank you so much. Whoa. Last one. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. Jesus was crushed for us. That's what it reads. 
Isaiah 53, the whole chapter, but just a few of the verses. Surely, this is speaking about Jesus. This is the, this is the Everest of Messianic prophecy, people call this chapter. That's the most. Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. This is fulfilled in all of Matthew, but but really the end of Matthew, Matthew 20, um, 28, it says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his his life as ransom for many. This Jesus didn't just stay in the nativity, he grew up, lived a perfect life, and then in obedience to the Father, was pierced for our transgressions, as the prophet Isaiah would say. Crushed for us. Bore the sins of the world for us. This is God's story. It was planned. His plan of redemption. It's a cel- Christmas is simply just a celebration of what we just saw. The celebration of this plan saying, God, yes. Thank you. Thank you. God making all things new. God rewriting where we messed up and we got wrong. God fixing our sin problem with a savior solution. That's what he did with Jesus. God mending what we've torn to pieces. God stepping in by stepping what? Stepping down. To be born in a feeding trough. In a smelly little room with animals. I have a little surprise of... uh, I have the prophecy number 11 that wasn't included with all of you. I have have a different prophecy. Watch this one on the screen. In Exodus 12, 13, we got introduced to something called Passover. And it said, the blood shall be assigned for you. This is to Israelites when they sin. The blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. From way back when, a perfect animal sacrifice... The blood of that would allow the people to be saved from their sins. God would literally just look over, pass over their sins and say, I accept that as a sacrifice. But you got another one coming. And so throughout the Old Testament, they would say, where's the lamb? Where's the next lamb? Where's the next lamb? We got to kill another lamb. Where's the next lamb? Where's the next lamb? And finally in Matthew 1, 1, we finally get, here's the lamb. Behold the lamb. Uppercase L. John puts it like this. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is often called the Lamb of God. That's why. It's, it's the prophecy of, he fulfills the prophecy of this Passover. That now he, when you believe in Jesus, you receive the atonement for sins. And God sees Jesus' blood and sacrifice for you and chooses to pass over the sins. And judgment on you. And all that judgment falls upon Jesus. He took it for you. We went from, wow, we really need a lamb. To behold the lamb of God. It was all part of this plan. That's Christmas. From the cradle cry in the the night um, to his cry on the cross. His whole life was perfection. And it was all for you. And God wants a relationship with you. So what say you today with all of this? Some people think that we, that even just like December in itself could just, you know, we, we, the world get its dark place. But then in December, for some reason, we're like, oh, we have signs of hope. And humanity just tries to, you know, um, pull up their bootstraps and say, I can do it myself. I'm just going to make myself into a good person. The more loving we are, the more money I donate, all this stuff, it's just going to make me into that better person and save me somehow. And I feel good. And I just want to feel good. But just look around. We are so far from perfect. Our world, even in December, when everyone's supposed to be nicer, we're so far from perfect. Everyone's just liable to snap at any moment. That's why C.S. Lewis wrote, we all hang this sanity by a thread. Because we're all rotten to the core. 
broken sinners. We all miss the mark every single day. The world can be a very cold and dark place. And hint, 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 that's why when you're saved, you're kept here. Because light shines brightest when it's so dark. So this is important. Because I need hope, you need hope. I need light, you need light. We're all in this together. I need Christmas 24-7. I need this story to be true every day, not just in December. That God would send a perfect sacrifice and I could believe in him and have atonement now for my sins. I need that to be true every day. And I want to have this joy because of that. I want to have Christmas cheer every day of the year. Some of you in here need to realize you can wake up every day and think, wow, Merry Christmas indeed. It can be a Merry Christmas because of Jesus. I desperately want you all to know, love, and cherish the God of the Bible. The God who made all things. The God that wants a relationship with you. That did not throw a plan together. That designed this plan according to his perfect will for you. For all humanity to have an opportunity to believe in his perfect son. So my question to you is, are you going to let another year go by of acting too cool for school? Or maybe this is the year where everything changes and it finally hits home. Maybe even today is your day. Or maybe this holiday season you're just meditating more on this idea that this plan was planned by God. And Christmas is so much more than just December. It's more than the presents, food, feelings, the lights. And maybe this is the year you're finally going to experience the light and joy of Christ for the first time. I pray for you. So uh, in the closing, here's my question to you in the last uh, slide. Uh, I, was, I was thinking, here's the question for you. What can I do different this Christmas season because of the hope I have in, in Jesus, what can I do different because of the hope I have in Jesus coming to earth that could make an impact in someone else's life around me? Make this really personal. Because this is our theme today, remember? This anticipation of Christ arriving, we're looking forward to it. There's lines. We're waiting. Where is he, Jesus? Oh, there. Where is he, God? There he is. The anticipation of Christ coming should produce hope in you. I have hope. I just saw 10 reasons why, and there's more. Jesus fulfilled all prophecy. He's coming, and he's going to be born in Bethlehem because it was said he was. God said he would. So he did. And this hope in you should just overflow into this Christmas cheer. Now, Christmas cheer is a, a tricky thing. Really, it's just gospel cheer. You need to have gospel cheer year-round. This is your joy and excitement for Jesus. And it's just kind of like the overflow of your time with him. And you're like, I have to tell someone about him. I, my life is just going to, to throw that to others and to extend that hope to others. I pray this for you this holiday season. Start it off right, December 1st. Let the anticipation of him coming. We've got 25 days, 24. It should produce hope in you and then Christmas cheer through you. Your, life, your friends and your family should be impacted by the joy you have in Christ. Is that happening or not? And you have some time to, to think through that. So spread Christmas cheer, extend hope to a hurting world. Let that sink into your heart and soul, and then do something about it. I pray for you. And come back next week, because we're going we're gonna to take time and not just pass over maybe a main character in this that does get passed over. We want to look at Mary's perspective. We saw God's perspective at Christmas. He was 10 for 10, and even more than that. But next week, we're going to see Mary. Imagine this young girl and, and Joseph being told that news. Come back next week, and we'll see that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these group of students. I pray that you would just make an impact in their lives, change us all for the better because of uh, Christmas this year, that we can wake up every day and say, it is a Merry Christmas, God, you had a plan. Thank you that this baby we celebrate grew up and everything's true about him. And we anticipate the arrival of Jesus coming to earth and we're so happy. And that should produce hope in us. We have hope for tomorrow. Some people will go to sleep tonight with zero hope, with no answers to the question of what happens when they die. Let this be the year that you could even spread this Christmas cheer through us, your servants. That would overflow 
and make an impact in our friends and family's lives. Give us an idea today. Make it practical. Give these students an idea. What could we do that's different than normal? How could we change up our routine? How could we help a hurting world? And we're going to pray that and ask that in your son's name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen.